a red light or <laughs> green light. <laughs> red light. Red, red light. light. Why does she got such long hair? I don't know. Nope, it still has to be moving. You're gonna die right here. Oh uh, yeah, I think I'm dead. You're. <laughs> 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 Yeah, oh, I, I was going to say, anyway. I'm pretty sure it has to be moving in a rhythm. I got something to say to you, Mr. Ballin. I'm still alive. Even though you've tried to hex us in previous videos. Even though you've tried to show us disturbing pictures that somehow, some way will hex you or make you or curse you or something like that. Was that only in the first one? I think so. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> all these are, like, all this disturbing stuff is just like, I... I try to mentally prepare myself for it by saying, it's, it's like, it cannot hurt me. It cannot hurt me. It cannot hurt me. All of a sudden Until I hear, it can. and then I hear a creak in the back room, in the back of my closet. I'm just like, pardon fuck? <laughs> like, what? What was that? So, top three photos with disturbing backstories, part four. So, this, uh, this series, the more we go through it, the more I'm just like, oh, the sad, unfortunate fools of these photos... The next thing you know, it'll have a photo of me in it. I'm just going to be like, Nick, am I dead? Nate, you've been dead this whole time. Uh... Yeah, but that's... <laughs> Sorry. Uh... Wouldn't make much sense for me. Like, who's been uh, paying my... Uh, it's a modern day horror film, paychecks, though, dude. Yeah. It's like... <laughs> it's, it's like... There's so many inconsistencies with a lot of horror films nowadays. Like, it won't matter. It's like, I've been getting paid by a ghost. Like, is ghost money real money? Huh. It's like, whose line is it anyway? The points don't matter and everything's made up. Much like our much like our financial system. Hey oh. Uh anyway, so we have uh, Mr. Ballin's top three photos with disturbing backstories, part four. Let's check them out. And hopefully we won't die. Today, I'm going to share die. with you three progressively more disturbing stories. And at the end of each of them, I'm going to share with you the picture that is famously associated with them. But before I get into today's <coughs> stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do when I upload three, four, even five times a every less week. Likely to die so now. if that's of interest okay. to you, please yeah. tar and Good feather deal. the Good like deal. button and then subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Mr. Bolly. Mr. Bolly. In September 2006, 26-year-old Jody Arias met 29-year-old Travis... Bless you, sir. You all right? Sorry. Yeah. ...Alexander at a big business convention in Las Vegas. The two hit it off that immediately, don't look like Vegas. with Travis on the same day he met her, inviting Jody to be his guest at his company's formal dinner that night. After the dinner was over, Travis and Jody stayed up all night chatting with each other, and the next day, Travis was telling his friends at this convention that he had, quote, found his wife. After the convention was over, Travis and Jody would continue to see each Pretty other, even though it was a long-distance like relationship. Yeah. Travis lived in Arizona, and <gasps> Jody lived in California. But they would meet up, and they would travel, and take beautiful pictures, and post to social media. It just seemed like they were a dream couple that were so happy together. While the couple's social media posts might have made it seem like they were this perfect couple, Travis's friends began to notice some very strange behavior by Jody early on in their relationship. Jody just seemed totally obsessed with Travis. She could not keep her hands off of him. Travis would be talking to his friends and Jody would come up beside him and literally grab onto him and cling to him. And Travis would try to push her off of him and she would just come right back and grab onto him. But it wasn't playful and jokey and funny. It was like she literally needed to be holding on to Travis. Jody would get really it's upset anytime Travis was interacting with a female. <clears throat> Didn't matter their age or their relationship to Travis. It was like she just could not hack any other females in his life. Yeah, that's a red flag. Yeah, this is stage five clinger. Abort, abort, abort. She would follow Travis anytime he went to the bathroom and she would put her ear to the door and try to eavesdrop in case there was somebody else in the bathroom. That's a huge that Travis red flag. Like, who else is in the bathroom? Ain't nobody in here but me and the Browns. I'm taking them to the Super Bowl. 
too. She began showing up to Travis's house totally unannounced at all hours. And one time when the house was locked and Travis wasn't even home, she snuck into the house through the doggy door. Initially, what? Travis's what friends just thought it was weird behavior, but over time, they started to feel like Jody might actually be dangerous. And so they sat him down one day and they kind of had like an intervention and they said, hey, Travis, there is something off about Jody. Her behavior is just totally weird and it seems like she is just never gonna let you go. I think you need to break this off and just find a way to cut ties with this woman. As they're speaking to him, they hear something outside of the room they're in, which had all the doors closed. And Travis stands up, walks over, opens the door, and standing right there is Jody. She was eavesdropping and she was furious. And she looked in at all of them and gave them absolute death stares and stormed off. Shortly after this intervention, Travis takes his friend's advice and he does break it off with Jody and he kind of moves on with his life. Now remember, he lives in Arizona and Jody lives in California. So you'd think it would be pretty easy to break up because you're never going to run into each other. And that's what Travis was kind of banking on. That he that's not how, uh, like, <laughs> hate to say no, it. No, she knows where you live. Not the, yeah, also, California and Arizona aren't that far apart. That's a hop and a skip. Mm. I mean, heck, you could take an you probably take an Amtrak there or something. Like, yeah, it's like a day. me dating someone who lived in South Carolina. <clears throat> it wouldn't be that bad. Like, no, it wouldn't be. He could get a fresh start and never see her again. But about two weeks after they broke up, Jody moved to Arizona. Around the oh, same time, Travis no. starts dating a new woman named Lisa. And almost immediately, Jody starts stalking Lisa, showing up at her house, tapping on her windows and running away. She starts slashing Travis's tires. I mean, she was a total menace. She was trying to break them up. But a few months after she arrived in Arizona, Jody ultimately packs up and heads back to California in April of 2008. And Travis, Lisa, his girlfriend, and all of Travis's friends are so relieved, they felt like, now the breakup is final. Two months after Jody leaves Arizona and goes back to California, Travis misses a really big business meeting. Oh, and at first no. his friends are calling him and kind of giving him a hard time about missing this meeting, but he wasn't responding. And after a couple of days, his friends decided they needed to go do a welfare check and make sure he really was okay. They go to his house, they open it up, and immediately when they walk in, they see blood on the carpet and they're calling out for Travis. Travis is nowhere to be found. He did. They walk through the Rest house the and they discover in the bathroom Travis's body. He was dead and laying in the tub. They call the police, who come over and immediately Jesus. suspect Jody Arias, who denies that she was ever there, that she had left, she was in Arizona, that she had nothing to do with this. But during the investigation, they find a camera inside of the washing machine inside of Travis's house. They were able to dry it off and extract the last few pictures that were taken on the camera. The first few pictures are of Jody herself. She's clearly inside of Travis's house. And then at some point she goes into the bathroom where Travis was, he's taking a shower. She takes this picture and then immediately following this picture, she proceeds to stab Travis to death. Oh Jeez. man. Ooh. Like this is literally like the moment before his passing. Mm -hmm. In May of 2013, that Jody is. Arias was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in jail without parole. Good. By September of uh, 1985, yeah. the Nevado del Ruiz yeah. volcano... Don't fuck with crazy people. No. Crazy people can be good fun, but... When they start showing up at people's houses uninvited and shit, get a restraining order right away. Yes. Immediately. 100%. Arm yourself. Yes. Make sure all your locks and security is up to snuff. Yeah. Columbia was starting to show signs of significant activity. The tremors had become so powerful that the citizens of a nearby town called Amero, that was home to 31,000 people, they started to become very concerned. You know, if this thing were to go off, we're only 30 miles away, we'd be leveled. And unfortunately, just a couple of months later, on November 13th, 1985, the volcano would erupt, and it would create a massive mudslide that would oh. just devastate Amaro. The mud flow covered like 85% of this before. town in heavy, thick sludge, it destroyed buildings and bridges, and it killed 25,000 people. Jesus. Remember, there's only 31,000. What year did he say this happened? 85. Yeah, I think I've seen this on a volcano documentary before. I Probably the same, dude. I mean, this is...
So I used to be interested in stuff about like uh, stuff like volcanoes and natural disasters when I was younger, and I watched a lot of stuff on TV when they had stuff about them happening. So I think I've seen these pictures before, possibly. And people in this village to begin with. So 80% of the population has been killed by this mudslide. Because of how big of a disaster this was, it took a while for the rescue efforts to mobilize. And so anybody that was on the fringe of being saved, unfortunately, perished because no one was there to rescue them in time. And then when rescue crews did get out and did start helping people, there just wasn't enough. There weren't enough people to help. And so hundreds of people that could have been saved were just trapped and no one could get to them in time. Photojournalist Frank Fournier arrived in Colombia two days after this eruption with the intent to photograph the ground rescue that was going on inside of Amero. When he actually arrived in Amero, he was really shocked to see just how completely destroyed this town was and how totally ineffective the rescue efforts were. It was just totally chaotic. It wasn't really clear who was helping who. There were people literally dying all over the place. It just seemed crazy that this was not being handled better. Amid this chaos, a farmer approached Frank and told him he needed to come over and try to help this girl who was trapped under a house. So he brings Frank over to this house that's been completely submerged in water and mud and clinging to a branch is this 13 year old girl named Omira Sanchez that's been trapped up to her neck in water. She's pinned by something in the water. They didn't know what it was, but she's been there for 60 hours. Jesus. When Frank arrived, he spoke to the other rescuers that were there trying to get her out. And they said that she's been in great spirits and she's been joking about how she doesn't want to be late for school. She's just been a really positive force and we really want to get her out. But, you know, it keeps raining, so the water keeps rising and she's already up to her neck and she's just trapped. We can't get her out. Shortly after Frank arrives, Omira went from chipper and lively and kind of making light of everything to most likely realizing that she wasn't going to get out of the water. And so she began telling the rescue workers to let her be, to let her rest. And she propped herself over this branch and she just laid there kind of allowing herself to pass away. Frank felt totally helpless. I mean, he's looking at this poor girl that's going to die unless they can get her out of the water, but no one seems to be able to do it. And it just seemed totally impossible that we can't just find a way to get her out. But it would turn out that her foot was pinned under a brick door and her aunt, who had passed away and was trapped under the rubble, had grabbed her ankle and had died that way. So oh, it was like a death grip on man, her ankle. Jesus. And so not knowing what to do, Frank just did what he knew how to do, which was take pictures. And he knelt down and he took this picture of Omira. And very shortly after this picture was taken, she would pass away. This picture would win the 1986 World Press Photo of the Year. When it was published, it was so disturbing that this poor girl was not able to be rescued, that it created an international backlash on Colombia's nearly non-existent rescue efforts. Damn, dude. It, you know, you read about natural, like, natural disasters, it, the whole deal with that is, like, uh, the first 72 hours are the most important time. The, the, mo the first 72 hours are the most important moments. As soon as you hear about that, as soon as, like, it, like work needs to begin immediately. Yeah. Because anyone with injuries is going to be gone in 72 hours if they're not saved quick enough. Exactly. And for that, you would need, I would say, like, thankfully we have a National Guard here that is, is really quick about getting to... Uh, like getting to where they need to be for disaster relief and all that, and that's their main their main thing. Like that's one of their main like operations here stateside is they prep for that all the time. They prep to deal with natural disasters like forest fires or landslides or uh, or uh, uh, I, we don't really have that many active volcanoes here in you know stateside, but <clears throat> they prep themselves for almost everything. And it sucks that, you know, that little girl was not able to be saved because of the death grip that her aunt had on her had on her foot. That's just Also, 
I have Ed a feeling. Bean was always a little uh, bit off. His classmates and his teachers were Ed called Bean. him being very shy, but at the same time, having these strange mannerisms where all of a sudden he would burst out hysterically laughing, usually at something he had been muttering to himself in class. The school blamed Ed's we mother for Ed's kind of dude. odd behavior. Yeah. Ed Gein is one of the most infamous uh, serial killers in American history. <clears throat> His exploits are so legendary that they've that it has inspired multiple film franchises, including the one that you're seeing here, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yep. One of the main inspirations behind the depravity of the family is that of Ed Gein. But anyway. Because Ed would admit that his mother punished him if he showed signs of having friends. So Ed's childhood was incredibly lonely and isolated. Ed's mother would confine he, along with his brother Henry, to their farm. He was basically never allowed to leave with the exception of school. And when he was at the farm, his mother would regularly read from the Bible and would tell Ed and his brother Henry that basically everybody else in the world is evil. We are the only pure ones. Everyone is evil and you should stay away from them. In 1944, when Ed was 38 years old, he and his brother Henry were burning away some marsh vegetation on their property. And at some point the fire got out of control and the fire department had to be called in. And after they put out the fire, Ed was okay, but they couldn't find Henry. He was just gone. That night, Henry's body was found face down in the marsh in that same area where the burn was going on. He had died of asphyxiation. At first, the fire was blamed, but then authorities discovered that Henry had actually died before the fire started. And so all eyes turned to Ed, who was the only one with him at the time, but there was no hard evidence connecting Ed to Henry, and Ed said, I didn't do it. So Henry's death remained labeled an accident, even though basically everyone believed that Ed must have been the guy I that strangled his that. brother to death before the fire was set. Shortly either. after his brother's death, Ed's mother also died, leaving Ed alone in this farmhouse. Ed began to make some modifications to the farmhouse, not to improve it or to make it bigger and better, but rather to <coughs> board off all of the rooms in the house that his mother ever used. He basically made them time capsules. He didn't touch them, he just sealed them off. And so he confined himself to a single room in this farmhouse that he did not take care of. And so filth is just piling up everywhere. And so he just kind of lived in squalor in this one weird room. While living in seclusion, Ed became obsessed with cannibalism. He basically spent all his time reading about cannibalism inside of this tiny room in his boarded up farmhouse. Oh, and that's how he man. lived his life for the next 10 years. No one really ever saw him. Then in November of 1957, a local hardware store owner, her name was Bernice Warden, goes missing. When police show up at the store to have a look around, they find bloodstains all over the place and they discover in the register that the last person to make a purchase inside of the store was Ed Gein. So they go to Ed Gein's house to interview him and see if he knows anything about Bernice Warden. And so they're bracing themselves for probably finding her body at Ed's house. But they were not prepared for what they actually found at his house. What they find would end up inspiring movies like Silence of the Lambs, Psycho, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Basically, mm -hmm. inside of Ed's house was a whole bunch of human remains, but not in the way that you would imagine. Turned into Ed furniture was taking and shit. human body parts and making things like kitchen utensils and bowls, and he was using skin to create seats and lampshades and bedposts. I mean, his whole house was like built of human bones and flesh. Bernice Warden's body was found as well, and she was kind of hung up as if she was next up to be made Butcher. into some sort of kitchen utensil or chair or table. When questioned, Ed confessed to killing Bernice Warden, but as for the dozens of other bodies that were inside of the house, he claims they were from robbing graves, but no one really knew if that was true or not, and they weren't able to ever actually convict him for anything beyond the killing of Bernice Warden. As for his motive, he told investigators that what he really wanted to do, what he intended to do, was build what he called a woman suit that would resemble his mother and it would allow him to, quote, crawl into his mother's skin. He was deemed unfit Jesus. to stand trial, and he was sent to a mental hospital where he stayed until his death in 1984. Here is just a sampling of some of the things that Ed Gein made oh. using human body parts. What is not pictured here are things like his lampshade, his seat, 
as well as his gloves and his belt. If you feel so inclined, you can Google those things. All right, that's gonna do it, guys. Let me know in the comments section what you thought of today's stories. Really? I'll get back to all the early commenters and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's stories and you haven't done this already, please tar and feather the like button and then subscribe <laughs> to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of like weekly uploads. Today. Feel free yeah. to DM me on Instagram and, and on Twitter. Yep. My username's the same on both platforms, johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok. My username there is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit. It's just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. If I use your story on purpose, I will credit you. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, some combination, just know that I'm really appreciative of your support. And until next time, guys, that's going to do it. See ya. Dang, man. Ed Gein. I mean... Fucked up, dude. Yeah, they talked about uh, Harrison Claybold in the last ep in the last one of this, and now he talks about Ed Gein. I wonder if that's going to be a thing. Like, the last one's going to be a, like, a more well-known story. Maybe so. I mean, I, I don't know. We but, might get around to talking about a lot of the most infamous killers. Oh, I know the one, like, the picture of, uh, of, uh, John Wayne Gacy with, like, the mayor of Chicago and his wife. That one is still terrifying to think about. It's like, the man in this picture is shaking hands with the most powerful political figures in the, in the city that he did this, and he murdered over 30 people, like, maliciously. It's like, holy mackerel. I don't get it. I mean, it's just... Damn. So, so... I believe there are some interesting pictures of the uh, French catacombs as well. Oh, yeah. Dude. Might end up touching a lot eventually. Yeah, there's there's just so many creepy pictures out there. I mean, I hope that we get I hope that we get some, some good stories moving forward. And oh, I mentioned the knowing... French catacombs. I want to watch out of the buffs of below again. <laughs> of course you do. It's a good-ass movie. Yeah. I, Underrated horror film. Either way, I guess that's going to do it. This was uh, Mr. Ballin's Top 3 Photos with Disturbing Backstories, Part 4. We're going to continue this because I know that a lot of you out there want us to keep going, but if there's other Mr. Ballin videos that you want us to watch, feel free to head over to our Discord and uh, let us know uh, which ones you want us to watch over there. And until next time, signing off, I'm Nate. I am Nick. Y'all take care out there, everybody. Bye-bye.